Hi folks, good afternoon. It's Margot Arceri with Tri Spy Tours and welcome to another episode of Throwback Thursday, the true tales from the early days on Long Island. Um, today we are coming to you from a Vista Point uh, looking over Port Jefferson Harbor and we're going to be talking about Kate and the Strong family going to Port Jefferson. Um, but in the meantime, I will let a few more folks sign on and uh, give you a little background uh, on TriSpy Tours, and then we'll, we'll speak a little bit about Kate. Um, TriSpy Tours uh, started seven years ago in collaboration with the Three Village Historical Society. Uh, TriSpy is a play in a triathlon because we do a walking version, a bike version, and a kayak version along with Pomonok Tours of Setauket. So that was a wonderful partnership with Kevin. Um, so we are hoping that sometime this summer we'll be able to uh, start doing tours again. Um, if not, we're going to keep coming to you and doing some virtual stuff and modified. Um, this Saturday we'll be uh, live on Instagram with Danielle Campbell and News 12. And we're going to be discussing the culprit firing and the strong family history. Um, a little bit about my story. Um, when I started the company, Barbara M. Russell, the Brookhaven town historian, was quoted as saying, lucky is the child who hears the story from an elder and cherishes it for life. Um, so I am that child. Um, I actually first heard uh, the story of the Culper Spiring from the only female member of the Spiring's great, great, great granddaughter, uh, Kate Wheeler Strong. Um, and Kate was an historian. Uh, she lived a few houses away. Uh, she was blind the last 40 years of her life. She lived till she was 98 years old. Um, but she loved storytelling. Um, and she used to write uh, for the Long Island Forum, her monthly publication, which I actually have a copy here. So there's a copy, and that is actually a sketch of Cousin Kate, as we referred to her, or Miss Kate, um, about the true tales from the... Uh, early days on Long Island. And one of them was about Nancy and her magic clothesline. So, magic clothesline, wow! So the story kind of stuck. Um, and then uh, the Long Island Forum would put out these publications, um, a little booklet pamphlet, and I have one here, um, with multiple uh, of Kate's stories in it. So you can see here that there's probably about 12 different stories inside. And then she would give these out uh, to the neighbors every uh, holiday, she'd have a holiday gathering at her home, and she would hand them out. So I'm lucky enough to have a bunch. Um, as I said, uh, Kate loves storytelling and writing stories, and she loved to have the children come around her bed. We'd go up to her house, and she would sit around this bed. There was a little parrot in the corner, and she'd tell us these stories. She'd tell us how you'd eat a bucket of dirt before you died. Um, she talked about how she was one of the uh, caretakers for the National Weather Service. I actually have a photo of her here. Uh, taking uh, the weather. Uh, so that's kind of neat to have. I don't know if you folks can see that there. So that is Miss Kate, Cousin Kate. Um, but when she still had her eyesight, she loved telling the kids in the neighborhood the stories when she taught religion at the Stony Brook School. And uh, when she went blind, uh, the one thing she did miss um, about the storytelling, especially with the children, uh, you know, was the was the look of surprise in their eyes. You know, she always felt that stories shouldn't be read. They should be told with spontaneity. Um, so today, I hope to follow in her footsteps and tell a great story about uh, the Strong family from one of her true tales uh, called Let's Go to Port Jefferson. So I'm going to step out a little bit and give you a little swivel here. So you see Pirate's Cove over there. We have Port Jefferson over to that way. And if you look all the way out, that's the Long Island Sound and way across is Connecticut. So that's actually where Caleb Brewster um, used to travel. Uh, and this is actually the spot on Strong's Neck where Anna Smith Strong would come out and to look to see where Caleb Brewster was. So it's a wonderful vista point and we're lucky enough to be able to be here today. Um, but let's get into the storytelling of why we're here. Um, there are going to be some questions at the end. So if young folks or you guys are tuning in, I'm going to ask you some questions. So pay attention and you can answer them in the comments afterwards. And when we're finished filming today, I'll go back and, and uh, take a look at them. So today we're going to say, let's go to Port Jefferson. Um, 
When I was a youngster, we always went to Port Jefferson shopping at least two times a week. I had the feeling I would like in memory to take that drive again. It's a fine summer Friday afternoon. The horses are at the door promptly at two. My mother and sister get into the back seat of the carriage and I climb up next to father. Father clucks the horse and start off in a steady trot. When we reach East Atawket, we swing left to a little building where Lyon's store now stands to mail some letters. And this is where the East Atawket post office is. We had gotten our mail in Setauket already early that morning. Mrs. Lyons was the most kind about reaching out the window to take letters. She once told me that when the parcel post first started, someone brought a bag of ripe tomatoes to mail, thinking Uncle Sam would take care of everything. Uncle Sam, represented by Mrs. Lyons, did take care of them. She packed them in a stout carton, marked them perishable, and sent them on their way. On we go, round corners and up Gildersleeves Hill, down Port Jefferson Hill, and across the beach. We pass the Port Jefferson flour mill on our right and notice a team of white mules waiting to have their wagon loaded. Next on the left, a ship is on its way, perhaps the bark Ideal Abbot, back from a trip to New Zealand, sailing one way and back the other, thus going around the globe. We pass the road to the steamboat dock and draw up in front of Darling's store. While the family is shopping, I run across the street to the harness shop and leave a bridle to be mended. Some years later I went there with father to pick out a harness for my very own use. The men were not used to it. From there, I go to George Smith's tin shop and make my way through the many stones to the back of the store. Here I drink the wonderful cool water which he pumps from a well so deep it is said the water comes from under the sound all the way from Berkshire Hills. Now I must hurry back for the family is ready to start on. Next to Darling's store was Wilson's sail loft with places for straw storing furniture below and a long room above where the sails were cut and Mr. Wilson had his office. He was always glad to show you the plans for suits of sails for many ships. But we have no time to climb the stairs now as we are driving on. Past Campbell's boat loft, where at a later date, father bought me a pair of light oars for my birthday. Memories play tricks sometimes, and I cannot remember whether the blacksmith, blacksmith shop came before or after Campbell. At that point, Time is no longer had the pyramid with the bell on top to ring time for the men at the shipyard. Scriner's butcher shop was on the corner. There we always bought a fine roast of beef, which we had hot on Saturday and cold on Sunday for the servings to go to church, according to Mother's New England tradition. At the corner, we turned to go round the block. The store at the corner later held an exhibit of William Davis's paintings. Saxon's boots and shoes came next. He had a most delightful pair of doll's rubber boots for sale. I wanted those boots so badly when I was a little girl, but I had to contend with a pair of the doll's rubber bought from the rubber factory in East Atawket. Rich's store was a brick building, just an ordinary dry goods store most of the year. But at Christmas, the stairs at the back led down to the most delightful place where tables were full of all sorts of things price from five cents and up. Ten cents stores were unknown in those days. I remember my sister had bought a beautiful pocket knife for ten cents. Near Rich's Road ran down a little shop where my older sisters had been able to purchase wooden dolls for a price of a penny. They were all gone by the time I was old enough to shop there, but I was given a small wooden churn that had come from the shop and with which I actually churned a pat of butter the size of a pea. Mrs. Davis's store was so much bigger before the road crew cut off a piece of it. Somewhere along this part of the road, at a latter date, I tied my mare to a tie post and went shopping. When I came back, Lady, my horse, was tied to a different post further down the street. The mystery was solved when I met a friend later 
The moment she met Lady dragging the tie post down the street. She had untied the post, which was rotted at the bottom, pushed it into the gutter, and tied the horse in a safer place. At West Barber Shop, where it was taken to have my bangs trimmed, one wall had shelves covered with gorgeous individual shaving mugs. The names of the owners were printed in gold, and the decorations on the mugs were all sorts of fun colors. We passed the Bank of Port Jefferson. Next was a music shop. Mother bought my mandolin there. Later for years, it was Dare's Drug Store. A little farther on was a giant willow tree, so close to the butcher shop that the steps of the shop almost had to go around it. The Port Jefferson National Bank was at the corner, then turned right into what was called Jones Street. Uh, just so you know, that's present day Main Street. Uh, at one time, it was planned to have a trolley from Patchogue to Port Jefferson, and the tracks were laid along Jones Street. When the project was abandoned, they were covered with dirt and the road was made to cover them. One day, driving down the street, I saw a white wooden tombstone. On it was the inscription, here lies the burial tracts of the Suffolk County Traction Company. Where are no bonds now to return to our drive? Randall's store was on our right where the telephone central was. There was a rival telephone phone company for a while. Then came Bentley's Carriage Shop, where the cross street is now. That was where a carriage was built. Next came Liz Smith's boarding house, famous for its fine food, and front stood a row of beautiful willow trees. When the town decided to put in sidewalks, they cut them down. Miss Smith fought it in vain to save them, but to no avail. As it was a sunny day, we probably met John Billy Brown driving in with his horses from a seat high up on one of the biggest and highest road sprinklers that was ever made. Now we turn for home. Soon after we come down Gilbersleeves Hill, we turn square right toward the shore to buy a bottle of the talk at spring water. When she mentions here that she's gonna turn right toward the shore, that's actually Van Brunt Manor Road. And so Talkett had its own spring water, fascinating. This water was well known even as far as the Philippine Islands. Then the round corner is up Brewster's Hill, so that's Main Street right past uh, the Brewster House. Passing the green, the churches, and down to the bridge. That was where the old Strong's Neck Bridge was. And the horse's feet made a merry tattoo. From there, we knew it took exactly 12 minutes to get home. We often timed it with so when someone was coming from the train, so we knew what time to put supper on. When we reached the house, old Jenny, a Civil War vet, came out of the garden to take the horses. We picked up our purchases and went into the big, cool house our shopping over for that week. So that was something going to Port Jefferson and all those shops. So, um, for you young people, um, why did you think they planned to travel to Port Jeff? Um, so why would they want to go there? That's because most of the shops are in Port Jeff. I'm going to give you some of the answers here. So does anybody know where the former East to talk at post office is now? There's quite a famous deli, uh, on the front side of it. So see if uh, I'm to talk it. So see if you can figure out where the old to talk it post office was, the East to talk it one. So where is Gildersleeve Hill? Um, that's the hill you go up before you head into downtown Port Jeff. So you pass Van Brunt Manor and you go down the little gully and you come back up towards like Washington Street into Poquot. So that was known as Gildersleeve Hill. And why did they cross the beach? Hmm, because when you got down to where the marinas are, that was all beach. So they had a crossover to that. And the flour mill uh, is located approximately where like the village hall is, so across from the town of Brookhaven, the docks. So um, interesting story, absolutely. Um, and I love hearing about all the buildings that are no longer there and just really how Kate and her family, you know, spent everyday life. Um, let's talk a little bit about the Three Village Historical Society. Um, we do feel at the Historical Society that the community is our museum. So on the tours, we always like to weave in some non-Revolutionary War history. So I'm hoping I'm bringing a little bit of that to you today. Um, if you ever get out on one of our kayak tours, we 
we kayak right in these waters here. Um, we talk all about the uh, activities and the espionage that took place here. Um, but at the Historical Society, obviously, we rely on our events. Um, and right now, we're not able to have any. So if you sh hang over to there, shoot over to their Facebook page, there is a Donate Now button. So we would love it um, if you could even give $5. Every little bit helps. Um, you know, we do hope everyone is uh, healthy and, and staying safe. Um, this Saturday, uh, we're in for a real treat. Uh, Danielle Campbell, uh, News 12 Long Island anchor, is going to be hosting um, Tri Spy Tours on her Instagram page. So that's Saturday at 3 p.m. And we're going to really get into the Long Island history of the Culper Spy Ring. We're going to talk about the Strong family and how did they end up in present day Strong's neck. Um, so that should be an interesting talk. And Danielle's always a ton of fun, so hopefully Saturday you can tune in. I want to wish all the moms out there a very, very happy Mother's Day. You know, we understand these are certainly um, difficult times, but let's, uh, you know, keep our eyes set on the time we have with family that maybe we ordinarily wouldn't have had. So um, we are thankful for that. Anyway, um, I appreciate you guys turning tuning in. Next week we're going to be coming to you live from the Setauket Village Green, also known as Meeting House Green. We'll discuss when George Washington came to town. So that should be fun. Um, wishing everybody a positive day, and God bless you all. And hopefully we'll see you Saturday. If not, we'll see you next Thursday for another edition of Throwback Thursdays, True Tales, in the early days on Long, Long Island with Kate Wheeler Strong. Thank you all for tuning in, and uh, we hope to see you again real soon. Take care.